Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, yes. Did I guess Alex back there? Yeah. Thumbs up. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, so my talk will be on dyslexia and archaeology. Um, just to first get it out there, the term dyslexia tends to be a catch-all. There is actually no accepted definition of what dyslexia is. Uh, it tends to be probably broadly categorized as learning, uh, learning problems. Most people think of dyslexia, as you see right up there on the slide, uh, you know, reading letters backwards, spelling them backwards, all sorts of stuff like that. That is only one symptom. Not everyone who has dyslexia has that symptom. Um, there's all sorts of different things that happen. You can have problems with reading. You can have problems with listening. You can have basically all sorts of problems with short-term memory. So, for example, some people have trouble remembering phone numbers. Um, so if you were to read out a phone number, they might only remember five or six of the digits, not all seven. So that is sort of the different symptoms that you run into. There's obviously the classic people writing backwards, reading backwards, having trouble with that. But there's also different symptoms as well. So reading is not just messing up the letters. Sometimes it's pattern recognition. There's a lot of different issues. And they all kind of broadly get categorized as dyslexia. And so one person who has dyslexia can have completely different symptoms from someone else who has dyslexia. And there's different sort of ranges. So you can have very mild form or a very extreme form in which you can barely read or um, have very lots of problems with short-term memory. So when I'm talking about dyslexia, basically I'm talking about learning disabilities um, around reading and writing. Here's some uh, symptoms that you might notice uh, if you happen to be teaching students. These are some of the things that basically how it manifests itself. So a lot of people without, with dyslexia don't like to do reading or writing, which we'll get to of why archaeology might fit into that. Um, but you run into a bunch of different problems, and it can be very frustrating for people with dyslexia in the sense that people will say, why can't you do this? And they literally cannot do it. Um, it's fast. And so it runs into different issues. People with dyslexia can sometimes read a lot slower, so they can read at half the speed of everyone else. So if you're doing classwork and you're like, okay, everyone, let's read this book. Most of the class will finish well before the person with dyslexia. Uh, same with um, writing. If you have, let's say, timed tests or exams, they usually can write at half the speed or a third. It depends on the level of dyslexia. So there's a reason why some people, when they get to university and they get diagnosed, they ended up going to special, basically, exams where they have more time. And that's just simply because they can't, compete, uh, can't complete their essays in the same amount of time as mo most people. Is dyslexia a disability? Um, in the UK, disability has a fairly broad definition. So it's basically anything that has sort of a negative effect on the long term of your life. Uh, and that covers a lot of different things. Uh, officially, dyslexia is considered a disability. It's recognized. As you'll notice, there's um, some special, special rules for stuff like arthritis um, and diabetes, stuff like that. But for the most part, it can be hidden disability as well. And so d dyslexia, long-term effect, there's really no cure for it at the moment. And so it does, by definition, be classified as a disability in the UK. Out of the UK population, about 17% has a disability of some sort. No one is quite sure how many people have dyslexia in the UK. Numbers range between 5 and 15%. You see it right now typically in younger people, and that is basically because they're now able to diagnose it. Um, if you were born in the 1950s, you were just slow. That was it. Um, you, didn't, you weren't dyslexic. There was just issues. So you're seeing a lot higher rates in young people, and I'm pretty sure that is just basically because they're now recognizing it. It's not because suddenly you know, our population is becoming dyslexic, younger, you know, something in the water. Archaeology. We do not follow the general pattern of the population. General pop po population in the UK should have between about 10% working age disabilities. Profiling the profession, question asked. It's going up, 
which I'm not sure is a good thing or a bad thing, but barely 2% of archaeologists are recorded as having a disability. Out of that, uh, possibly 16% of them might have dyslexia. And there's another, uh, basically, survey that happened, a couple, well, 10 years ago. Um, it was basically disabilities in archaeology. And because of their methodology, we're not sure, but they estimate between 2% and 10% of archaeologists have a disability. Um, that's where we get the 16%. Profiling the profession does not break down those numbers to detail dyslexia. But the highest, uh, basically, disability listed was dyslexia at 16%. Students. Archaeology students are a bit abnormal when it comes to dyslexia. So um, this is the basically data gathered by that report 10 years ago. And they found uh, about 14% of students from the different uh, programs they surveyed have some sort of disability. Almost 9% have dyslexia. They also get, at the same time, different data from HESA, which is the Higher Education Statistical Agency. And that has archaeology only about 10%, which they're not quite sure why those numbers don't match up. Uh, I suspect when they survey the departments, departments recognize some students with disabilities, but don't, it doesn't get reported on high enough into the university where it gets reported to HESA. Uh, but they basically, HESA has slightly different numbers lower number of students with disabilities, 5% with dyslexia. Um, the real interesting thing is, out of the UK population of students, about 1.5% have dyslexia. Archaeology either has, you know, 9, 5 to 9%. So we're about five times more likely than the population, the normal students, to have dyslexia in archaeology. And when you look at the different sort of disciplines and degrees, you find that more people with dyslexia go into more hands-on uh, degrees. So agriculture ends up with a very high percentage of people with uh, dyslexia. Uh, literature ends up with almost 0% people with dyslexia. As you can imagine, uh, if you, there's a lot of writing, a lot of reading, you tend to avoid that if you have dyslexia. I took, it the, took a look at the numbers recently. Um, I broke it down into a little more detailed uh, cohorts, as it were. So looking at first degrees, postgraduates taught, which is your master's, and postgraduate research, your PhD students. Really interesting is that a lot of undergraduates um, in archaeology have a much higher percentage of disabilities than if you go further on into your studies. So they've recategorized dyslexia into learning disabilities, but it's about 8% of all students in archaeology in the UK have dyslexia. And that's general, there's not, all other disabilities tend to be spread out. It takes up about half and the majority of people with disability in archeology. span Really interesting is taught, as soon as you go on to a master's, it just drops. You lose a quarter of the students um, who have dyslexia. So a lot of students may be going into archeology span as an undergraduate but they're not continuing on in their studies. Um, so it gets a little better with you know, research PhD, which I imagine has more to do with, basically you could do independent research, so you can do more hands-on work if you wanted to. But we actually are losing lots and lots of students who are not making it out of their first degree. And so you're probably seeing students with lower grades because of their uh, disability, and it's translating. And so by the time you get to PhD, there's actually much fewer students than what you would expect if, you know, everything being equal. So why are there some differences in these numbers? Why do we have only 2% of archaeologists being recorded as having dyslexia, but, you know, 8% of the students, 9% of the students? One issue, I think, is how we're recording this. So if you'll read this quote, which I'm sure you're all reading right now, um, basically this is from that report, uh, Disabilities in Archaeology. Uh, it's from one of the people interviewed. And basically, disabilities have to be self-recognized. So there's no mandatory testing. And a lot of these surveys happen to go to employers. So prof profiling the profession is all done by your employer. So 
if your employer doesn't know that you have a disability, they're not going to mark it down. So I actually suspect we probably have a fairly high percentage of archaeologists, probably around that 8% that have dyslexia. They just don't report it to your, their employers. Makes kind of sense. Why would they need to know that if you're digging a hole? Um, there's all sorts of issues around that, but I imagine a lot of people won't report their disabilities because they either don't think it's a disability or it's not relevant. There's also some stigma attached to that as well. So it can be very hard to work with disabilities in archaeology. Now, I'm sure all the other papers, uh, well, not all the other papers, some of the other papers today will touch on that. But when you're working and you have a disability, it can actually affect your ability to be employed and, you know, the willingness of employers to employ you as well. So um, this is a quote I really wish I knew who that person was. Um, but this is some of the attitudes you run into in archaeology. This is, a, again, from that same survey. This person did not believe anyone with any disability could work in archaeology. I would have to disagree with them. Um, and I think the evidence shows that people can work in archaeology. But when you run into stuff like this um, and attitudes like this, I doubt many people are going to come forward and report this. So I think we're looking at actually probably a pretty high percentage of archaeologists, higher than the average um, with dyslexia. But for various reasons, that's not going to get reported into the data. Some very concerning things happening now, though, is uh, the disability students allowance in England and Wales is being cut come 2015-16. <coughs> which means all support, not all support, but most support going to students who have disabilities is going to be cut. And potentially that could really affect students with uh, dyslexia uh, or many other disabilities. And so there is a concern that in the future we're going to see these numbers drop and that you're going to have fewer and fewer archaeologists who have dyslexia, mainly because at the moment, 98% of all archaeologists have a degree of some sort, and almost half have at least a master's or a PhD. And that's already a big concern because, as we saw in those numbers, when you go to master's and PhD, you lose a lot of the students who have dyslexia. And so we're possibly going to see fewer and fewer uh, students and possibly that's going to translate into fewer, fewer archaeologists with disabilities and issues such as dyslexia. I, these numbers have stayed pretty flat for about the last 10 years, so I don't think we're going to see increased diagnosis. I don't think, I think we've hit that point where most universities are now able to identify students who have dyslexia and able to get them help. It doesn't seem like these numbers are going up or down, though I do think they might go down with the cut and funding and support. And I do have a general concern that if, you know, based off of those comments from the survey, it may not, have, having dyslexia or any disability, may not be the most uh, welcoming thing to have in, in professional archaeology. And there's a real concern that we are going to be seeing less and less people with, say, learning disabilities like dyslexia or any other disability uh, making its, their way through the profession. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned um, the fact that more young people are recognised with dyslexia, which yeah, I, I understand that. Have you looked at that with regards to the postgraduate studies? Because I know a lot of older people generally take up postgraduate studies, certainly PhD level. I know the Department of Exeter, for instance the proportion of people under 30 doing a PhD is actually relatively low. And so maybe what we're seeing there is not that people, it, it, what you're seeing is that you're just not recognizing the dyslexia in the higher people. Yeah, um, those numbers have stayed relatively the same. And so it's not sort of an issue of diagnosis. And we also see similar levels in um, further education students. So those, sorry, those are just higher education but we see very similar levels in further education as well that sort of mimic that, which further education definitely has a much, skews much older, much, much older. Um, and it is one of those things where there, a lot of people when they're getting to university are now being diagnosed as well. So a lot of the people coming in are not, 
they've either been some have been diagnosed before, but a lot of people get diagnosed in university, and a lot of times to get the disability help, you need to be reassessed at university. So most of these people who have been registered have been reassessed at the university. Um, so I think that's catching it. I don't think it's an age thing, but I do. Yeah, that's a good point. It could there could be some minor effect on that, but it doesn't look like it from everything I've looked at. Yes, sorry. Uh, two questions. One of them just coming through from Twitter, so I'll put that one first. Um, and it's a, a, a relation, two different people asking a related question about that uh, higher figure for undergraduates, that five times as likely as other students. And, um, one person is asking a bit what you covered about is there a perception that it's a soft fashion where people the way people fit? Uh, I, I came back to the you said it was about the perception half man text in it. Um, and then somebody else came back to is that also true with geology? Well, any yes. geology. geology is similar to archaeology, about the same same levels. Uh, it might be a percentage point lower or higher. I, it's in the same zone. It's in the same zone. So you, you basically, you, if you look at all the sort of more hands-on, um, outdoor-y sorts of majors, they have much higher ranges, and, and arts as well. So um, the arts have almost as high as archaeology, so painting and stuff like that. Yeah, um, and then once you go to things like mathematics as well, I forgot, I should have actually mentioned that as well. Um, parts of dyslexia can also affect reading numbers and doing math as well. Um, but yeah, it, you see it mainly in more hands on. And some sort of anecdotal evidence is during that survey, one of the departments did report that they actually have more students coming in with disabilities. So transferring from other majors to archaeology because they found it a lot easier to work with. Um, and I think it's, it's also a bit more complex. Um, some universities have higher instances than others, and I'm not sure if that's because they're better at reporting it or catching it, or if that's because some departments are more hands-on than others, because I do know there is a lot of writing and reading and lots of archaeology courses, so... Well, I was going to say, I mean, when you think about a lot of the kind of work that you have to present at this conference, you know, it's incredibly text-heavy, and not just text-heavy, but really, really complex text. And, and sort of slight differences in the use of one word, whether it's an ism or an entity, and suddenly it means something completely different. So, you know, it's actually quite, it's quite dense text, isn't it? Yeah. Another possibility is also um, people with dyslexia also tend to have higher than average um, spatial skills. So actually, it's weird. They either have really poor spatial skills or very, really great, very high level, which helps when you're in archaeology and trying to think about 3D, you know, different strata and stuff like that. So it can be a help depending on what level of dyslexia you have or what type. And also, I suppose that was kind of the other question that I had was that you talked about the support of dyslexia, people with dyslexia get in in university if they have been diagnosed and if the university actually responds to that. But is there any support that people with dyslexia could have after leaving university? Depends on your employer. So uh, try to work for a council. Um, for a large, a larger employer. So councils are very good because they have HR departments and they'll work. So theoretically, you, if you go to your employer, according to the law, and say so you have a disability, they have to do an assessment and figure out a way to work around your disability. They can't discriminate against you. But archaeology being archaeology, um, oh, you know, we don't have enough jobs, temporary employment, you just don't get rehired. So, I think there's a lot of people who don't like to go and talk about getting an assessment, especially if you're digging around a two-week contract. Um, that they, I think some employers would like to work with people, and I think others may not um, work as well. And so that that as another reason, I think there's under uh, reporting is basically with a lot of temporary jobs, you don't want to be that one who you know makes extra work for other people when they're doing your assessment and. Yeah, that can be a bit rough. And then also it can tend to ruin um, work relationships as well, because sometimes employers won't explain that, you know, this person can't lift the, the bucket because they have back issues. And then you see this one person not doing as much work, builds resentment and so forth. Um, I would say, yeah, if you're, if you're a council, they'll definitely do assessment. Universities will do assessments by law. Technically, all employers have to by law, but um, I think most people wouldn't risk it with smaller employers or if you're on a temporary contract. Um, I'm actually dyslexic. <laughs> so I can kind of talk person next to it. I'd say if you go to the commercial sector, it's almost easier to 
to kind of hide the fact that you are dyslexic because you can you can team up with somebody, you can, you can check your context sheets, um, and you can possibly team up with somebody who isn't very good at the drawing. So you do the drawing, and they write the context sheets. So I think I was diagnosed at the age of six, so I kind of I'm at the point where I have lots of coping strategies that I don't even think about now. And I think if you get support at the right stage, you, you develop ways of coping. <coughs> not necessarily hiding it, but just going on with it. Um, but I do agree there is a whole spectrum of people with different issues. I've got a, a colleague that I work with who's absolutely useless at numbers. So I have to check whenever she's doing written books, because quite often she gets them backwards. But because I know that, I can I can compensate for her, um, and she can kind of check on stuff that I do. Um, so I think it, I, it depends on what kind of experiences you've had within employment. Um, I've got a really good boss, he'll just kind of, he knows there are spellings that I have issues with, or, you know, site names. Um, if it's quite unusual, and he'll just spell them out. Um, he doesn't make a big deal of it. Um, so different people have different experiences. Do you mind? So I'm interested in what you said there about the numbers, because I hadn't thought about that. I've often had staff members who have great difficulties with spelling, and I thought to myself, these are people who are dyslexic. I haven't worried about it in the context. I just ignored the spelling problems. And in terms of data cleaning, from a kind of database, I just thought, you know, actually, I don't care about spelling in, 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 in the database because it's not actually that important as long as people understand what's being said. Um, but the numbers thing is interesting because if we aren't recognizing how many dyslexic people we have on site because we're discriminating against them, then we can be adding to difficulties with our data as well if there's things that aren't getting checked because we don't know we ought to be checking. You know, <laughs> Not, not all dyslexics have issues with numbers. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I discuss I, it. Yeah, I've always quite liked maths. Um, I might be slow at doing the sums, but I can, I can do the maths. Um, it, it's, you, tend, you tend to refer to it as dys, dyscalculia. So if a yeah. dyslexic is a difficult word to spell. Yeah, um, dyslexia tends to be the general one, but there's subcategories yeah. that have one. That's numbers. Um, there's a couple of other smaller subcategories, and that's the problem with no definition. Is kind of end up with yeah. these weird subgroups. Uh, but yeah, it, it is one of those things where it's such a catch-all term. It's most people with just any sort of learning disability, and they may not be the same. What's causing it for some people may not be the same cause as others. Um, some studies show it might be genetic, but yeah, that's all that sort of stuff. Yeah, um, but it is also it's one of those things where they'll prop. A lot of dyslexics with coping mechanisms will avoid what they don't, as you're saying, what you don't want to do. So uh, you, it is very easy to do that on site, where you can just avoid finishing out the context. You say, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll shovel the, the spoil heap, yeah. the job no one else wants to do, but you'd rather do that than have to write. Well, well you know that somebody else is going to be kind of checking the sheets before they get written up, so you don't actually need to worry about spelling, um, which, is, which is usually the case. You just go for it. But I think it's I think it does come from what experiences you've had because there will be dyslexics who've had such bad experience that they won't have the confidence to kind of admit that they're dyslexic. I I've grown up with it. Um, my mother assesses people. I'm quite comfortable talking about it, and when I need to, if I don't need to, and it's not affecting the job that I'm doing then there's no point in mentioning it. But if there is something where I think, okay, I've got a report to write, I know it's going to take me longer, I'm just going to kind of, you know, my boss knows that, so it gives me the leeway. Um, whereas you, I still encounter people who don't believe that dyslexia exists. Um, it was something that was recognised and defined over 100 years ago now. Um, so it's something that's been around for a long time, but it's often classed as, oh, it's a middle class excuse for lazy, lazy students. Or, you, you still encounter people 
with that too. Yeah, or it's everyone thinks dyslexia is you screw up the numbers when that may not be your issue at all. Yeah. As you basically switch number numbers, letters, yeah. whatever, whatever. Um, and some people may not actually know they have dyslexia. So I was almost completely finished with a PhD before I found out I had dyslexia. And it was a bit shocking when I realized when they told me I wrote at half the speed of no everyone else because. That's just the speed I wrote at. And you usually don't realize that unless you're put next to someone who, <coughs> for lack of a better word, um, has a normal sort of level of ability. So a lot of people you'll see with bad spelling, and they may not even know that they have dyslexia or problems with numbers. Uh, you, you get a lot of people who say, I hate maths, and they never ever want to do maths and never do it ever again. And a lot of people actually go into archaeology because there's some math, but very little. Um, and that's because they hate it, and a lot of it actually happens to be they just have undiagnosed dyslexia. Do you think there might be more of a stigma in academia? I can think of one academic who famously sent out an email saying that everybody was having my spies for Christmas and he was flying them. Um, and um, not many people actually know that person is dyslexic, he does. But he goes to elaborate lengths to cover it up. Yeah, um, academia in general is not kind to people who don't don't fit a certain uh, mold. So having difficulties, um, especially in very high competition, you know, 10 jobs come up a year, graduate 150 people with PhDs, um, very difficult, very tough. But there are several archeologists who've gone through, or professors now, who do have dyslexia. Um, one department had four members of staff with dyslexia from the survey. So uh, it is possible to go through um, with these issues, but it is, I. Fewer people do PhDs with dyslexia, so I think it is tough to go all the way through. Thank you.